The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and our for our viewing audience. I would say viewing, but you're a listening audience. This is the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission getting ready to start our forum at noon. What's up with drones? Hopefully you're tuning in right now. If you have any trouble, you can email my email and we'll give you some more instructions. So we're going to actually begin at noon. So just to, as a tester here, we're going to have each of our speakers say hello, just the word hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> All right, just a moment, we'll be starting our forum. Exciting day in Ohio, across the region, we have a number of events taking place. Down at the CMC luncheon today, our State Department Director will be speaking about transportation. So we've got us all across the community covering a lot of great topics. So we are 30 seconds away from starting our program. Hopefully you're tuning in, getting a sandwich. And uh, this will be a great topic. We will take questions at the end. For our in the room audience, you can uh, type your, or write your question on a sheet of paper and pass it to Bevan, who's going to give away. That's where we, we could direct the in room and certainly go ahead and uh, write any questions that you have that come up during the presentation. We'll allow some time at the end. Now, one more minute, we'll begin. All right, we hope that everyone's tuned in today to the What's Up with Drones. After this event, you'll get a link to all the slides, and during the presentation, you'll be able to ask some questions. So I'm Eileen Luby, Membership Services Coordinator here at the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. We'll be assisting with uh, some of the monitoring today. Let's begin. Please welcome the Executive Director of the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Lloyd Murdoch. Well, thanks, Eileen, and welcome everybody uh, here in person and everybody uh, on the phone. Uh, we're excited to have you join us in a uh, webinar on drones. So we are excited here at the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission for the future of technology. This is something that we pay a lot of attention to. Uh, if you know Morpsey, we are a regional council of local governments, and so everything we do is through the lens of local government and how we can be helpful for it. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you see that uh, we have a 15-county service area in central Ohio, and so many of our listening audience are from folks from around this, this region. Uh, our member-based organization serves everybody from tiny villages, townships, rural counties, urban counties, city of Columbus, uh, many of our suburban communities, and more. And what our work looks at is local governments in certain issues, those being transportation, sustainability, data, residential services, and we also work on helping them communicate and advocate for good policies as well. So this is something that's a focus for us is to help connect all of these different types of governments around Central Ohio to good ideas and good practices. On the next slide, one of our major focus areas is transportation and infrastructure. And we cover the gamut from uh, planning the region's uh, core federal dollars for transportation to helping our rural communities with transportation. We work on community programs, uh, bicycling programs, transit programs. We work on economic development programs around transportation. We've even got some special studies, whether it's Rickenbacker or safety. Uh, we've even got some construction avoidance things coming out with paving the way. Um, all of these get to how to make our region's transportation flow better. And when I say transportation at Morpsey, I usually mean surface transportation. But today we're going to uh, jump up from the ground and we're going to talk about a technology that is gonna revolutionize not just surface transportation and air transportation, but how local governments uh, work on their own projects, how they help their residents, 
how they enforce things, and it also gives them a new thing to uh, determine how to uh, help make sure it improves the quality of their community's life and environment and not makes it worse. So um, we're very interested in today's topic. Um, I happen to be a proud member of the Drive Ohio Government Advisory Board, and Drive Ohio is a statewide effort. Uh, this is the statewide effort that is leading the, all of our focus on uh, drones and aerial uh, technology, and we're really excited to have them address us today. So uh, let's get straight to it. I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers. Uh, first, we have Fred Judson, who is uh, with the Drive Ohio uh, group with the Ohio Tr Department of Transportation. At Drive Ohio, he is the Director of Unmanned Aircraft. He's got more than 23 years experience specializing in geospatial, uh, geospatial technologies. He spent the last five years in research and implementation of unmanned aircraft systems, uh, also known as UAS. Um, he's also a standing member of several committees and continues to work on uh, geospatial technologies as a known and renowned expert and on um, UAS for both local and national levels. Our speaker after that is Pete Griggs, and we're excited to have Pete with us. He's a principal in the law firm of Brocious, Johnson & Griggs. The primary focus of Mr. Griggs' law practice is devoted to local government bodies in a variety of areas from labor, employment, land use, zoning, annexation, and economic development, um, and also things like unmanned aerial vehicles. So Pete frequently lectures and publishes articles on a variety of topics that affect public bodies, and we're really excited to have them here today. And so we will get into the presentation, and I'm going to turn things over to Pete. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Um, this is a little different for me. I'm used to like standing up and waving and moving around and, and, and all that, so I'll do my best here. Um, you know, when I gave this uh, similar presentation um, during the winter at Ohio Township Association, and, and I told the attendees there that when I was researching it, uh, this issue a little bit further, one of the things that I found was, a, it was an article about grocery stores now going to be delivering um, groceries by drones and the police one of the they interviewed one of the local police chiefs and you know he was had some serious concerns and he was quoted as saying it's definitely a high stakes situation that's a joke everybody get it high stakes groceries okay. that's the best i could do okay so uh, i always like to start with the joke but i apologize it, it was really difficult to find a good drone joke uh, so, um, you know, when you, you know, as the director said, I, you know, my, my practice is devoted exclusively to representing local governments throughout the state. And, and I, I've often found that many of my clients are reactionary, um, that they don't do something until, um, something bad happens. Um, same goes with technology. You know, you, you, you look at, um, how technology has not only impacted our, our personal lives, but but even even the public sector and you know um, cell phones, um, smartphones, uh, you know how it's affected public sector employees. You know always um, always in touch, always able to do their job, which arises labor and employment issues. You think about 20 years ago, how many townships had uh, or local governments had Facebook pages? Twitter, Instagram, um, that social media platform, that technology uh, now allows them to provide information directly to their residents, but also raises legal issues. Um, you know, the, the electric scooters, um, Lyft, um, you know, those type of things, all that technology impacting uh, local governments. And I, I don't think drones is any really any different. Um, if you look at some of the numbers, uh, the FF, FAA has projected um, that drone use will more than double from 2017 to, to 2022 from uh, 1.1 million to 2.4 million. Um, and those are the, the, the model hobbyists. Uh, commercial uh, use as well is going to uh, more than triple during that same uh, time frame. So it's, it's, it's coming, uh, it's here. You know, governments are now finding ways. Again, I, I, I think, you know, like I said, we're we're a little more reactionary, but I think governments are now starting to catch up with 
uh, uh, private sector and, 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 and uh, private use. Uh, and some of the uses that, that we found, um, some of which our clients are doing, some of which they are not, um, is uh, I have on the pro uh, projector uh, zoning. Um, we get the question a lot, and we're starting to work with several of our clients to be able to use drones for code enforcement. Uh, that's a potential use. Now, with that comes some legal implications that I'll go over in a little bit. Uh, but that's 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 one potential use. You know, uh, a lot of times some of our zoning inspectors will use the uh, the Google uh, satellite imagery that you're able to look and and zoom down into a property to see if something has been constructed in the backyard, which they may or may not have gotten a zoning permit for. Um, so code enforcement is an issue. Uh, infrastructure, uh, I think, is a fascinating one, and when you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, you know, for an engineer to have the ability to fly a drone up uh, to inspect um, an underpass or an overpass, uh, infrastructure uh, inspection, uh, I think, is uh, somewhere where I see um, drones being used uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, none of our clients have 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 use this, but uh, I have seen several other municipalities are now uh, looking at using uh, uh, drones to fog for mosquitoes. Um, and when you think about it, it make, makes sense. Rather than driving the, 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 the truck down the middle of the street, uh, seems to me it may be uh, more effective to, to have uh, the fogging capabilities put on a drone uh, and to fog for mosquitoes uh, that way. Mapping, obviously, um, is being used everything from parks and rec to um, you know all kinds of, uh, of areas that, that that a municipality or local government would need need to map. Uh, the biggest area where I think I've seen uh, is uh, police and fire. Um, I I think these technologies uh, are I mean they're currently being used. Um, the a few of the areas are um, firefighting. Um, I've I've seen situations where, particularly out west, where they're sending drones in to get an aerial of how the fire is uh, moving. Uh, prior to using drones, they've had to send firefighters out there, which makes no sense to send firefighters out there when you can have an aerial view and you're not putting um, somebody's life in, in jeopardy. So. Those are actually huge out west. They are using those all the time. Um, law enforcement. Uh, there is a, a fascinating program in uh, in Louisville right now that's called uh, Shot Spotter. And again, I, I don't pretend to know how this technology works on that type of level, but these are. Uh, drones that are situated throughout the city of Louisville. And when a gunshot is detected, these things, based upon the technology, automatically respond. And it gives law enforcement the ability to get eyes in the air prior to responding. Uh, so that is an actually fascinating uh, use. Um, you know, researching a little further, some of the issues have been Sometimes they, you know, uh, backfire of a vehicle. Uh, these things will go up. Um, uh, fireworks, but um, you know, fighting crime uh, is a use, uh, and, and I actually see that as being um, probably, in my opinion, one of the number one uses for local governments is in the police and fire uh, area. Um, uh, Search uh, if 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 uh, hot pursuit situations uh, they're being used uh, right now as well to search for um, potential suspects. Uh, some of these things are also equipped with uh, heat sensing capabilities, so you're able to use it at night. Um, so so here are some of the other uses, some of which are public, some of which are not. If anybody remembers the whole shutdown of the uh, Gatwick Airport for several days because somebody decided they were going to fly their drone uh, in the uh, in the airspace uh, and it shut down uh, the Gatwick Airport. Um, 
Another situation that I found fascinating was in Sacramento, the housing authority is using it for security purposes. So every night between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., uh, drones are deployed. And uh, they actually fl they fly uh, and start uh, recording at about 200 feet. Uh, and one of the drawbacks that some of the residents of that housing uh, have cited was privacy rights. So I think from a governmental perspective, that's something that you're going to have to weigh uh, the evasion of potential privacy rights versus the, the, the public benefit of using it. But uh, uh, at least according to the Sacramento Housing Authority, they've seen great benefits, um, reduction in crime, illegal dumping, um, trespassing, uh, those type of situations is, is what it's been uh, really used for. So in terms of, of current regulations uh, here in the state, there really aren't any. Uh, that's because uh, the FFA has exclusive jurisdiction um, to regulate uh, drones. So there is not any Ohio law per se. Um, so local governments don't have the ability to restrict things like flight, uh, flight pass. Um, they can't ban them in certain areas. Uh, they can't mandate training. Licensing, no local registration, all that is preempted by the federal government and, and given the uh, exclusive authority of the FAA. In fact, the FFA has put out a nice little um, press release that is entitled uh, FFA Statement Federal versus Local Drone Authority. And I'll save you the trouble of reading it. It basically says you have none, uh, except for potentially one land use zone slash zoning area. Um, if you were to zone for landing sites. Uh, I'm not aware of any of our clients that have done that because I'm not sure it's a huge issue, but you would have the ability, uh, much like you would to zone for an airport, um, to, to zone for landing sites. Um, so really the, the, the authority is going to rest with the federal, with the federal government. So, in terms of governmental use, um, you are going to be subject to FF, FAA regulations, uh, and it's part 107, and it, there's a process that you have to follow in order to become licensed to operate a small, and I'm going to use the word drone because it's much easier to say than um, uh, unmanned aircraft system. So. <laughs> um, but there's a process, um, and I believe the, the small designation is 55 pounds or less, which is, I don't see governments using anything, at least local governments, anything more than, than 55 pounds. But there's a process you have to follow. You have to get a, a, um, a pilot certificate, um, and there are things that you're not going to be able to do without a waiver. Uh, and those things are listed up here. Um, you're going to have to be below 400 feet unless you get a waiver. Um, you cannot fly over uh, anyone not directly participating uh, with the drone. Uh, no night flights. Uh, obviously, can't fly under the influence. That's that's common sense. Uh, can't fly from a moving vehicle. Um, so there's a bunch of you know there's some speed requirements and things like that. So there's a bunch of things that you can see that are generally prohibited that when you think about law enforcement and fire that uh, you're going to run into an issue with. So you do have the ability to request a waiver. Um, and, and during the um, presentation this, this winter that I gave, there were several law enforcement agencies uh, in the room. They've obtained the waivers. Um, they said it's kind of a Right now, it's kind of a lengthy process, and, and it's, sometimes it's hit and miss, and you have to go back um, several times as part of your waiver process, but they were able to uh, obtain them. Um, so just know that uh, if you want to do something that's contrary to the regulations, that you have to obtain a waiver. Um, now, there is an effort that the FFA is uh, uh, undergoing 
um, and it's a study that was launched in 2017, and, and it's up here. And it's really kind of, I think, designed to, to try to make things simpler for governments. I think that's the end result. Um, but they've, they've granted uh, these, these, these kind of pilot programs to, to some of these states for drone use. Um, and I think, like I said, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's designed to look at how states are using it and to maybe eventually streamline the process. Um, so the last thing I really want to kind of talk about is current law. Um, so you don't have the ability to regulate, but in terms of, let's say for law enforcement or local government, if people are calling and complaining, um, uh, uh, common law still applies, so you may have a, a privacy issue, a nuisance issue, uh, there may be a civil issue. Um, there are municipalities that are passing voyeurism uh, legislation. Uh, all those things could be to could come into play. The, FF, the FAA has actually issued a law enforcement checklist um, for how law enforcement is to respond to uh, drone complaints. So something you may want to take a look at, uh, get with your sheriff or, or uh, your own police department. Um, but in sum, uh, in terms of, of recommendations that I would have for local governments is, number one, get with law enforcement, give them that checklist that's been developed by the FAA. Um, in terms of your own use, I think it's important to identify what areas you may use. I would have your legislative body approve the program. In that program, you should have general criteria of how you're going to use it. Um, and then obviously make sure that the people that are using it follow the, the FFA, FAA regulations. Um, and, and I do want to close with the Ohio Attorney General had a um, committee that was put together for law enforcement. And they published a sample policy and it's on their website. Uh, I think it's something if, you, if you're interested in having your law enforcement use. Uh, use drones if you take a look at all their, uh, the, that advisory group recommendations and policy. Um, so that's just kind of a, a brief overview of what you can use it for, uh, some of the legal issues, and uh, just a, a few recommendations. Thank you, Pete. Very, very, very good. Very informative. We'll try to also get that checklist uh, out in our close communication, and, and you mentioned the Power Attorney General yes. as well. Thank you. We're going to come back to you a little later in the program, but I want to move on to Drive Ohio. A lot of things happening across the state of Ohio this particular week. We must have hit the, 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 the target week here. So welcome, Fred Judson. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to add to what Peter is saying. Uh, the, it, there's law enforcement out there that have questions, too. They can go to the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy. They've got a really good, um, a really good training uh, for them to cover those topics. Uh, uh, so my name is Fred Judson, and it's not Judson, <laughs> like uh, my boss uh, likes to say. But the, the, the thing that's odd is when I was growing up, it was Fred Flintstone. And then my actual nickname was Barney, because it looked more like Barney than I do Fred. So, <laughs> so it went from the Flintstones to the Jetsons. But and you'll understand why once I get, to, uh, once I get into this, why, why it went from uh, Judson to Jetson. Uh, just uh, talking about uh, Ohio's aviation history, uh, just real quick, uh, obviously the Wright, the Wright brothers, uh, although this was over in um, uh, Kitty Hawk over in uh, North Carolina, uh, but it was our aircraft that was built and designed here. Uh, so thanks to Ohio, we were able to fly over in, in uh, North Carolina. And if anybody's from North Carolina, I do love North Carolina, I'm not going to get too much. Um, but this was actually the first drone, this is a Kettering bug. Uh, 1918 was the first flight uh, of that it actually had gyroscopes inside the aircraft. Uh, it measured distance by calculating wind and uh, number of prop turns. So interestingly like or not. But it was uh, self-correcting, which was a huge step. Uh, and and it, again, it was built and designed in, in Dayton, Ohio, as part of our rich history in aviation. So just a little bit about me and, and our organization and how we're formed. We are uh, part of the Ohio Department of Transportation's Drive Ohio initiative. Uh, so we are, I am the director of unmanned aircraft systems uh, from Drive Ohio, and sometimes the director of unmanned aircraft systems gets called uh, like a drone wrangler, uh, or a drone boss, or a robot wrangler. Um, 
but underneath there, I've got the, our two major sections. We, I got the Department of Transportation, where we perform all um, UAS activities for them, and then Fly Ohio, which is our effort to enabling the lower altitude airspace for more advanced uh, aircraft operations. Uh, and so I'm going to get more into this in, in the next few slides. But uh, what we, as the Department of Transportation Drive Ohio, are concerned with uh, when we enable uh, these type of activities, we can better uh, perform our jobs out on the roadways, but particularly for uh, maintaining service transportation. Uh, but uh, then if we start scaling up and we start expanding what the, the term, the generalized term drone means, we can start scaling up in the, um, in the aircraft and we can start looking at moving people <coughs> packages. And again, that gets down to enabling that lower altitude airspace, which now uh, gives us more, more different or enhanced modes of transportation, which aren't typically available right now. Uh, so this is, uh, and I see my, my arrow is not showing up too, uh, too well on the slides, but, but this is showing the levels of autonomy and kind of where, um, where the aircraft and the cars are, are actually on parallel paths. Uh, so if you start at zero uh, with the Model T, that's, you know, there's no automation, no cruise control, nothing. Uh, and then as you progress, you get to like the level three where you have a, some conditional automation, and that's your, um, you know, your adaptive cruise control, that type of thing. Uh, and that's an analogous to an aircraft that we have that's called an EV. It's a fixed wing. It does mapping type operations. Uh, and then you go to level four, which is high automation. And I have the Waymo vehicle there. It's, it pretty much goes out and drives itself. You still have a human supervisor that's involved, but it's pretty much making the decisions and doing the thing, everything on its own. We actually have an aircraft that is at level four, and it's called the Sky DIO which it works just like the Tesla car does uh, when it's in automation. Uh, it's surrounded by vision sensors and it stitches together the imagery and then it, it predicts its path into the future and it automatically moves around obstacles uh, on its own. So it, it, you still have it, you still have a human is supervising it, but it pretty much flies on its own. And if you guys want to see some amazing videos, just Google that Sky DIO on YouTube. It's pretty amazing stuff. But then, then we got the full autonomy which we don't have anything out there yet. Uh, the closest example is the, um, uh, the military aircraft, the XB-37, uh, I think it is. Uh, but that's fully autonomous, um, which is an amazing aircraft. I don't know if you've seen it land on aircraft carriers by itself, but it's pretty amazing. So under, under unmanned aircraft systems, we really break everything out into three major categories. Uh, we, we're looking at advanced data collection. Um, we, again, we perform all the data collection for the Department of Transportation or if a, con a consultant comes in, we'll do a review uh, and to make sure that they're performing operations as safely as possible, add a little more criteria above and beyond what the FAA adds. Uh, and then, what we, and then the, our next two ma major things that we're trying to do is enable package delivery because we see uh, both last mile, medium haul, and long haul as being uh, developing areas uh, that uh, most commerce did, that we can enable in Ohio. And then people transport, which is where the Jetsons thing comes in. That's how you know, I keep talking to so everybody thinks it's like crazy. Some people think it's crazy. So if you watch the room when you start talking about flying cars, you get either a stunned or amazed or, uh, you know, that's cool look out of people. But, um, but that is coming and it's coming quick. So I just want to go over just real quick some of the terminology. So I, you know, drone is a very generalized term. And when people hear drone, sometimes they, they say drone taxis, for example, or, or they'll say, but when, when generalized, the term drone usually means the small data collection aircraft. Uh, we at, at Drive Ohio and under the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Center, you know, we were expanding that, uh, that um, our scope to include all advanced aircraft technologies. And mostly when it comes down to movement of packages of good, we're really talking about vertical landing takeoff aircraft. Uh, and so how, how we enable that is, is the key issue that, that we're concentrating on outside of operations. And I'm gonna go over a few of those efforts and some of the big press releases that we had this week, uh, which is really exciting stuff for Ohio. Uh, and then there's a couple others, you know, we get into air taxi, air metro, these are fairly new terms. Um, the FAA is now, we're finally defining those, like uh, an air taxi is a point-to-point -point delivery of a person. Uh, and air metro is more like what Uber wants to do, where uh, you 
fit four people in an aircraft and you take off and then you land from defined points, which they call vertibores. Um, and then, so when we talk about manned aircraft systems, you're right, uh, Peter's right, the, it, a small unmanned aircraft system is defined 55 pounds or less. So if you broaden that scope and say unmanned aircraft systems, uh, now you've got the full range, it could be several thousand pounds down to uh, you know, a half pound. And so out of those three areas, I'm gonna expand a little bit on data collection and give you guys an update on, on what kind of activities. And being the point uh, agency for unmanned aircraft in Ohio, uh, we also act as a shared service. So not only do we do operations within the Department of Transportation, but we can we expand our services to other state agencies, whether it's Department of Natural Resources or uh, Department of Public Safety or um, or e even EPA. We, uh, we we do shared service type work for all those different entities. And then if if we're not actually doing operations, we we do assist uh, local law enforcement quite a bit, especially when they're trying to fill out their waivers. Uh, as we have a ton of experience of getting approvals through waivers and certificate of authorizations and section 333s and local on all into that, which is a lot of boring stuff, but it's just ways of accessing the national airspace system. Uh, but this is some of the aircraft that we have and, and some of our uses that uh, we see mostly that we, uh, that we complete, uh, whether it's for the Department of Transportation or other agencies. So just to uh, give you an example, this is, a, this is a good example of both mapping and emergency response um, and uh, doing uh, real-time video, which in um, some circles is called uh, situational awareness in, in first responder terms. Uh, so this is a simulated uh, earthquake that took place over in Indiana. We we're working with Indiana Department of Transportation, the Ohio Department of Transportation. It, it was uh, the, our crews are out practicing removing uh, vehicles from the roadway. We had two missions that we had to complete over there to, to uh, help out our, our, um, our response in this effort. One was to send our aircraft out to do the mapping ahead of, ahead of time, give the mapping results to our, um, to our, first, or to our uh, crews so they could see what was coming up ahead. And it's kind of hard to see in some of the pictures, but you can actually pick out like there's an electric line down, there's some sort of spill, but it gave them uh, awareness before they actually went out to the site uh, and, and give them better, gave them a better idea of what they were getting into. The next uh, mission that we had was to provide real-time video uh, of the forces at work, and that's what you see in the bottom right-hand corner. That video, uh, working with the University of Cincinnati, we developed a, a what we call a milestone transmission box, where we plug any ground control station, any video feed, and ship it to our uh, traffic management servers. Uh, that's accessible to anybody who has access to milestone, which can then be distributed from, uh, from Columbus to all of Ohio, uh, all in real time. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, but that's what the example in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, this is a picture of the box that you see developed for us. Uh, we do deploy that with our uh, forces whenever we go out. Uh, we'll either use this for any kind of incident response or we'll use this for uh, traffic monitoring as well. And I'll show an example of uh, traffic monitoring, I believe, in the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so, so April 11th was a big day for us. Um, I had crews, this is Spring Grove, Ohio. We had six simultaneous operations happening all at the same time. Uh, they were doing a traffic study for the for Spring Girl. All six were up in the air all at the same time. It's the first and the largest uh, traffic monitoring uh, effort that an unmanned aircraft, um, uh, from an unmanned aircraft ever. Uh, so we were pretty excited about that. So that was on April 11th uh, when we set up and. Um, and I'll show some of the traffic analytics that we were derived uh, from this video after that, or examples of it anyways. And then also on April 11th, and I'm gonna show our sky vision, we had an announcement. Uh, so I had, I had crews that were performing operations in Spring Girl, and then I had crews that were helping the Air Force Research Labs performing the first beyond line of sight uh, flights um, over in our sky vision area next to the, uh, at the Springfield Beckley Municipal Airport, which was pretty exciting for the state of Ohio and made tons of uh, news. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more, more about sky vision in the next slides. So I don't know if this will automatically play. 
Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, so this is an example. Now these are machine algorithms that were developed by the University of Cincinnati to collect uh, statistics on traffic. Uh, we use this information. It, we, typically, we throw it out tubes, or we will we'll erect a pole and we'll put a, a traffic camera. And this is really comes back to justifying our, our funding for our roadway system. Uh, but we're detecting classification of cars, um, you know, distance in between cars, the speed of the cars. And then all that gets put into our, our uh, calculations that we use for our funding mechanisms. So uh, now we can send up an aircraft rather than erecting a pole and collect this data in real time. Uh, but it's some really advanced work, and we're really proud of uh, the University of Cincinnati and the work they've done for us in uh, doing these machine algorithms for us uh, to be able to um, get this type of information from video, from an unmanned aircraft. So that was what they call uninterrupted flow. This is interrupted flow. Oh, okay, that one did not automatically start. Okay, Alex, again, should we press something? Oh, let me start. Yeah, uh, well, just to give you an idea of what was going on, uh, this is also doing the same thing that you saw on the previous slide, but it's but it's a stop intersection. So yeah, it's counting the number of cars per lane uh, as they're crossing that number one and number two, as you see on the screen. Uh, at, at the same time, another camera is watching the um, stoplight so it knows when it's red, green, or yellow. Uh, again, that all feeds into our calculations uh, for our transportation statistics, for, and then we can tie that back to our funding. So uh, the, the easiest way to do a return on investment for a surface transportation agency for our unmanned aircraft system is really bridge inspections. We're seeing a lot of uh, usage of our unmanned aircraft. In fact, I've got an operation going on today. Uh, over in District 8, where we're actually performing a bridge inspection with several bridge inspectors. And it really comes down to not only we becoming more efficient in our operations, but we're also with increasing safety. Now, what you see in this picture this is called a snooper truck, and it's a big arm from a truck up above that goes underneath the bridge, and people are, are sitting in the bucket. In this particular instance, there's also a camera guy who's filming us, filming him, which is kind of fun. Uh, but uh, they're looking at issues underneath the bridge. The problem is, is that a lot of times uh, we'll, the truck is up above the, on top of the bridge and we have to close off a lane, which increases hazards to the traveling public. When we can do, we can supplement some of that stuff with an unmanned aircraft, that's when we increase safety and increase efficiency. So when you start talking return on investment for unmanned aircraft for just small data collection drones, this return on investment is a really quick one to justify. Uh, just another example of some of the um, things that we see in bridge inspections uh, that, that's either hard to get to or sometimes impossible to get to with an unmanned aircraft system. And I won't go into all the details on, on what you see here, but uh, scour assessment, putting details, cracking, and delamination are just some of the things that we look at uh, when we look at bridge inspections. There's like a whole other story with that because I actually performed that mission. and I was told because I had to go through PTSD because it was a tough mission to fly. If anybody's flown a small unmanned aircraft without GPS, I think they would know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, that, that was a tough one. And it was tough for our inspectors to get the same information. But we completed the mission successfully and, uh, and uh, proved that the data was very valuable to us. So I'm talking about the Fly Ohio effort now. So I'm moving on from our operations and small data collection drones. Now I'm going to expand into advanced uh, data collection and um, movement of people and goods. And that's really what the Fly Ohio, uh, um, the Fly Ohio initiative is about. So this graphic, and I know it's busy. I didn't do it, so don't don't yell at me. But it's uh, it's NASA's, and there's a link to the bottom if anybody wants to see where it comes from. Uh, but this is NASA, so we're getting into the new terms we're calling unmanned aircraft traffic management, uh, and then building off of unmanned aircraft traffic management into what we're calling urban air mobility. And this is uh, a better uh, depiction than anything I can really do of what NASA sees as the future for uh, uh, unmanned aircraft, or what we're now calling urban air mobility. Uh, and, it does, and it goes for the whole size range from either small data collection drones all the way up to uh, freight movement, uh, long haul freight movement, uh, where you can see it's actually crossing, they have one crossing from Asia over to uh, the US. 
Uh, so it really comes down to how do we, as, as Ohio, help enable that because we want to see these new modes of transportation and, and additional ways uh, that we can move commerce through the state. It really comes down to enabling infrastructure to, to allow this to happen. Uh, and we've got a few major efforts, and I think you guys will be very interested in uh, in the next few slides. But you're going to hear a lot about unmanned aircraft traffic management or urban air mobility uh, and how we're trying to enable that. And, not, and we're not the only state that's looking at this. We're, we've actually are working with several other states at the same time trying to do the exact same thing. And what we're pointing is seeing is uh, highways in the sky trying to enable the, uh, that lower altitude airspace for that reason. Uh, so the the two efforts I'm going to talk about is our Sky Vision area, and the, uh, this map shows where Sky Vision's at uh, at the Springfield Beckley Airport uh, in uh, in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, that's where Sky Vision is located, and uh, I'll talk more in detail on that. And then the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor, where we actually have, with the help of the, uh, the Ohio State University, uh, a uh, unmanned aircraft traffic management. Um, research project, which is installing radar, both passive and active, along that corridor to enable what we're hoping that the FAA will allow us to do is the online site uh, um, uh, activities in the corridor as well. So this is Sky Vision. So that was the big announcement uh, that, that happened last Friday. Uh, the AFRL announced their the online site certificate of authorization from the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, the Sky Vision is the a Department of Transportation asset, so uh, you know we're good at uh, having enabling infrastructure for anybody who wants to use it, whether it's a highway or it happens to be a um, a detection and avoid system. Anybody who wants to come use that detection and avoid system is welcome to. Uh, but what this uh, what this uh, we lovingly refer to as the bus, by the way, and, or I like to call it the EM50. If anybody is a knows what the EM50 is uh, from Stripes. Oh, well, anyways, if anybody knows Stripes, I wanted to paint it lime green and they wouldn't let me. But anyways, so it's a 200 square mile area that uh, if you if you look, the pin in the center is where the Sky Vision is located at the at the airport, and then that yellow triangle is is the area that we've gotten uh, approvals from the FAA. Uh, that says that Sky Vision will confidently uh, detect and track all manned aircraft in that vicinity. And then with our concept of operations, we're able to deconflict the aircraft, the unmanned aircraft with manned aircraft uh, in that area. Uh, but as you can see, our radar coverage is actually a lot greater than that. But this is the area that we, uh, we put our safety case uh, towards. Uh, so this is just a picture of the dimensions of that uh, area. Um, so it, it it starts at uh, at a thousand foot above ground level, and then 10,000 feet um, MSL, which is about 9,000 feet above ground level, uh, for a 200 square mile area. So we have that whole airspace that we can uh, now perform uh, beyond line of sight activities in, um, which is like I said, super exciting for. Uh, the state of Ohio, and there's a ton of buzz going around about it right now. If you guys haven't heard, um, I'm sure you will uh, hear it soon. Just a picture of the inside, and I'm gonna, I only got five minutes left, so I'm gonna go through this kind of quick. Uh, so this is the inside of the uh, uh, of the, um, the Sky Vision. Uh, this is a, a video uh, of, of what we see on our monitors and how we deconflict uh, the aircraft that's in the area with our unmanned operations. Um, I'm going to go into. I'm, I apologize, but I am going to go through this pretty quick. So I'm going to. So that was Sky Vision. Now I'm going to talk about our other major effort, which is uh, unmanned aircraft traffic management system along the 33 corridor. Uh, where the 33 corridor starts in East Liberty, uh, goes uh, around Marysville, and then ends at the uh, OSU Airport. Goes through, goes through Dublin and ends at the OSU Airport. Uh, not only are we looking at um, uh, being able to track unmanned aircraft inside that corridor, uh, but we're also looking at the, how that unmanned aircraft communicates with the existing ground vehicle infrastructure. Because as, as everybody knows, that's a, a very big autonomous vehicle, ground vehicle um, testing area. Uh, now the research is trying to build on top of that, since we have all that infrastructure for ground vehicles, how does the uh, unmanned aircraft then utilize that existing infrastructure that's there? 
and, and how, how we can actually merge that together into a true 3D transportation system where the is 2D. Uh, this is just a slide of some of our partners uh, in, that we have working with us um, that is all being led by the uh, Ohio State University uh, and then all the rest of the partners who are very well versed in unmanned aircraft traffic management systems. Uh, this picture is just depicting uh, what I just described as communication between our existing ground vehicle infrastructure and the air vehicles. Uh, the next slide is a more a, a concept that was put together of, um, of what we perceive that would be the future if something like this were to happen. Now this is an example of, a, of our traffic operations center sending an aircraft out while it's being tracked. On the right hand side we've got uh, alerts not only for air but for the ground and then we're using the air then to um, see uh, in real time what's going on in, in the areas that we might have issues with. Uh, so in this concept we're, we're hoping that you know that we can remotely pilot the aircraft from the traffic operations center and, and this actually flies out on its own and produce and gives us real-time video of what's going on. And I do have to say this is not our video, this was a mock-up that was made and we were not flying over live traffic, just so you know. But, and that's not even the 33 quarter. So. Uh, I'm going to skip, you already covered a lot of the regulatory parts, so I'm going to skip through this slide, but uh, I do have links to all the different uh, parts and regulations, whether it's whether you're talking about a hobbyist small and made aircraft uh, under Part 107 uh, or Part 91, which is a lot of operations and when we do public uh, authorizations uh, will we'll be under Part 91 or Part 135 when you start talking about package delivery, which is something that we're trying to enable. That's and I don't know if you anybody heard the big news from Google last week, but Google got approval for uh, package delivery uh, under what they call Wing. And uh, Wing can now, they were given a special type waiver under Part 135 for their aircraft so they can start delivering you whatever it is they want to deliver you, like they're delivering coffee over, um, over in Australia right now. Uh, the next one, next slide is about the notice of proposed rulemaking. I'm going to pass in the interest of time on this slide, but there's some uh, good uh, notice, the new rules that are going to be coming out for flights over people and for nighttime operations. There will be rules that are coming out that's going to enable that uh, in, in the very near future. And then uh, the advanced rule notice for proposed rulemaking which talks about the unmanned aircraft traffic management system, which you're going to see a lot of regulations uh, or a lot of proposals come out in the near future for that as well. Uh, in this slide, I'll pass on this to you, but just in the interest of time, but uh, the slides will be available. Right? Yes, yes, yeah. these slides will be available. Thank you, Fred. I think we're going to move into questions. So uh, if you want to pass your questions in the room to our, we're going to introduce our director of data mapping here at MORPC, Aaron Schill, who's going to be a moderator for questions. Speakers, if you could just keep your answers to very short, because we actually have some good questions. So thank you very much. All right, we've got a few questions in the room and a couple of that have come in online, so I'll start with those. Uh, the first question is uh, from uh, a Parks and Recs department, and the question is uh, thinking about policies for Parks and Recs departments. Uh, can speakers provide some? Uh, guidance or even examples about parks and rec departments that have policies on allowing, uh, assuming the use of personal drones in public parks. Uh, a yes or no question on deciding that, and uh, if there are uh, any examples that might be out there. I'm not aware of any that are that are out there. I don't know if you. Uh, there is a couple. Uh, I would look at Cleveland Metro Parks, for example, and I, I know that the parks and rec in Columbus have uh, some uh, requirements as well. You, you can't manage the aircraft in the airspace, but you can manage who takes off and lands from your property. That's not saying you can't step outside the property and, and then and then walk, fly it over. Uh, you can't do that um, because the airspace is the FAA's. Um, but the the how or what activities can be controlled inside the actual property limits. Uh, so there is that, but there are there are a few, um, like uh, I mentioned Cleveland Metro Parks again, or, or Columbus, and, and I know a few others. National Park Service, for example, has, uh, has uh, some restrictions as well. Uh, so there are examples out there. Great, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, the next question, uh, as a local government, if I have need, uh, a need to use a drone, but do not have access to a drone myself, uh, what is the best way to go about finding your own services? Not asking for any specific recommendations. Yeah. Call Fred. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we'll always try to help or at least point them in, in, in the right direction. But um, that, that is a good question because there's not like a real good directory out there for unmanned aircraft system services. Uh, although I got it, the sky view sitting in the audience right now. So, <laughs> uh, but um, sometimes you know a way to do it is there. There is a registry of aircraft out there. You could go through the registry, see who's uh, commercially registered, and, and maybe approach it that way, uh, or or do a Google search. Um, it's probably the easiest way. Uh, but yeah, I agree. There isn't like a real good defined um, commercial services director for I'm in there. Great, all right, we're gonna move on to the next question. Uh, when public service entities are using drones, they're creating public information, uh, video they're capturing, and other information they're capturing. Uh, so can you speak a little bit to some of the record retention and other policy considerations that local government should give uh, prior to starting to utilize drones? And I don't think, I mean, there's, there's not any case law or Ohio Attorney General opinions on that type of data that's collected, but I would, you know, I, I would take the position that it is a public record. Um, so if you don't have it addressed in your record retention schedule, I suggest you amend your record retention schedule. Um, you know, recently the um, legislator provided for uh, body camera and uh, dash cam video. Um, obviously, drone was was not part of that. Um, but I, I tend to err on, on the conservative side and would call it a public record and make sure you address it in your record retention schedule. I would agree with that too. So we do do a, a I said do do, we do uh, a lot of different operations for different, uh, whether it's agencies or divisions within ODA. So we, um, so there is different retention policies that we have to follow depending on what, what it is we're doing. So if we're doing a bridge inspection, for example, that has a different retention policy than if we're doing work for communications. Uh, if we're doing work for the Department of Public Safety, that follows a different set of rules. So, you know, it just depends on what you're doing. And what we usually end up uh, doing is handing the data over to them and then they put it into their, whatever their defined policies are. Great, uh, so we have a couple of questions now uh, that are related. Uh, there is a question about who has the authority to intercept the drone, uh, and another question about uh, if a private citizen shoots down a drone, I'm assuming that would be a uh, publicly owned, uh, a drone owned by a public agency. Uh, what is What would be the procedure for dealing with that? Well, I mean, I, I, I do know that there it's illegal to shoot down uh, a, a drone. Um, now, what was interesting is I had somebody in my last seminar who was a, uh, a hobbyist and, and was a hunter and a fisherman, and he's had showed me pictures of his drone being shot down uh, several times, and uh, nothing was ever done. Um, but there, you know, from law enforcement perspective, there is, I believe, there's a regional. Um, and I can't find the word, but FAA, FAA has a regional. Yeah. With flight standards office. Yeah, that, that law enforcement can contact. Uh, and again, I think you follow you follow the the uh, protocol that they've laid out from a law enforcement perspective. And we we are the lead agency too for counter unmanned aircraft. And you're right. There's nothing you, know, you, you can't even if you see an operator out there flying an aircraft, you can't even mess with the operator because that's technically messing with the aircraft in operation. The problem is is that the FAA if you use the uh, whatever the even a small drone as an aircraft. So whenever if you interrupt the person who's flying the aircraft, you're actually interfering with the operation of an aircraft, which actually gets you into. Uh, it just somehow could get you to some hot water. Uh, so a lot of our efforts been, have been in the positive identification of tracking. Now that being said, we can only passively look for aircraft. We can't actively look for aircraft because then we're getting into wiretapping um, issues, uh, which is a whole other section of the law that I don't want to get into either. 
So there, you really, the only thing you can do, the best thing you can do is if you know somebody's operating and they're doing something wrong, is, is like Peter said, is contact the local FISO office, report them. Uh, if, if it's blatant, there's something that it's, they're violating a zone, you know, wait till they land the aircraft, and then you know, go and, and have a discussion with whoever the pilot is. Uh, but there really isn't a whole lot we can do at this point beyond the uh, new rules that are coming out for feds, the federal, uh, for like federal prisons, uh, which is giving some authority to be able to take the aircraft down over federal facilities, but that still doesn't do anything for us at the scene. Great. Uh, Fred, I think you touched on this, but I want to circle back to it to make sure that uh, everyone hears what they should do. So, uh, A, no shooting down drones. Uh, B, so if uh, if someone observes a drone entering banned airspace or no fly zone or something that would be of concern, uh, who are you going to call? I think you yeah, mentioned you, that, but you can say that again. Your local flight standards office, and they, they call them FISDO for short, and uh, just Google search will pull it up. There's actually three in Ohio uh, that you can contact. Um, it, it would help out a lot if you were able to identify who the pilot was so you could give them their name and, and so the FAA could properly follow up with the, with the person. Great. Uh, and I think the last question that we have uh, for now, uh, and it's the one that I've been saving because I'm the most interested in it. Uh, tell us a little bit more about passenger drones. When is this happening? <laughs> when am I catching a ride somewhere? <laughs> it's my favorite subject. Um, so Uber's looking at their first flights. They claim are going to be 2023. Uh, a lot of people think that that's too of an aggressive schedule. Uh, but that being said, the way Uber's approaching it is they've got about, I don't know, like half a dozen, I don't know the exact number of companies that they're working with. They've provided their minimum vehicle specifications that are out there as public knowledge. And they've developed this partner network in the, in the industry to develop these vertical landing and takeoff aircraft that eventually are going to carry passengers from back and forth. Their two target cities are going to be Los Angeles and um, Dallas. Uh, that, that's where they're going to start out, uh, and um, the way they're going to do it and why it might happen by 2023 is they're actually going to have a pilot in the aircraft, and the aircraft's going to have a certification from the FAA just like a normal rotorcraft's going to do. So it's not like it's going to be autonomous, fully autonomous right off the bat. It may have the capability, but they're not going to uh, use it until they get additional approvals from the FAA. So I do see, I do see a potential of it happening by 2035. Or, uh, 2023. Uh, I, the, I think the NASA projections, because there, are, if anybody is really interested in this urban near mobility, there's two studies out there that NASA has done, and what what they're calling this is uh, the tran transformational vertical um, vertical aircraft, transformational vertical aircrafts. Yeah. So it, the the, the new studies that are out there for urban near mobility, and that's what we're getting into. And NASA's got really good um, studies that are out there that they've sponsored. If anybody wants a quick, well, a, a read, there's several pages, but um, but it is really good stuff, and it is it is coming. So I hope I do see it by 2023. And part of what our unmanned aircraft traffic management uh, system that we've got along the corridor is trying to enable some of that activity. So you know, in the, at the airport, the the airport's looking at installing vertical ports for this kind of activity, where we can utilize our sky vision technologies to the, to help develop that that uh, you know, these new vertical land and takeoff aircraft technologies. So. Great, and I think that will that wraps up our questions. Uh, if anyone does have any questions that they uh, send in afterward or uh, that we didn't get to, uh, we'll ask our speakers if we can email those out and ask for them to send responses so we can share that with folks. All right, thank you for tuning in today. We really appreciate uh, having our two speakers and State of Ohio is now uh, certainly testing out all these new opportunities and with all, all of our automation taking place, we're, we're found that we're testing site. So we'll, we'll keep posted on what's happening with the FAA rules and let our communities know about that. And uh, stay tuned at our WAPSI website for all the activities taking place as we continue to plan our communities for the future. Thank you very much, everyone. We're going to tune out now. Thank you.